Hello, everyone. Welcome to Inside the Birds TV with Adam Kaplan and Jeff Mosher. And uh, today we are joined by a really special guest, not only a former Eagles coach, quarterbacks coach, but also he's coached in the NFL for quite a while. A lot of teams. He's been an offensive coordinator as well, along with quarterbacks coach and passing game coordinator. So we've got a lot, a lot of questions for our guests, and that is Coach John D. Filippo, who uh, was a big part of the coaching staff of the 2017 Philadelphia Eagles that won its first and only Super Bowl. So, John, welcome to the show. Really appreciate having you on. Thanks for having me, guys. It's awesome to be here. You got it. You got it. Everybody knows who knows you calls you Coach Flip. So, Flip, um, got to ask you this to start off with. Because you have, and people may not know this, some roots to this area, your dad uh, moved to this area to become the athletic director at Villanova when you were a, a child. Um, so you have roots to this area and you get to be a big part of the coaching staff of the only Eagles team that won a Super Bowl. So knowing what this area was like and how long these fans waited for a Super Bowl, what was it like for you to kind of have roots to this area to be a part of that coaching staff and that team? Well, it's, it started back when I was on the uh, coaching staff of the Cleveland Browns. I was my first coordinator's job in 2015. And our staff got let go. Our whole staff got fired with Mike Pettin was our head coach. And, um, you know, I was on the job market. And I'll never forget Coach Peterson calling me on the phone. And I'm, it's like a Thursday night. And uh, I start pumping my fist like this. And my, my wife has no idea why I'm getting so excited. She has no clue. And so I get off the phone. And I just keep saying, yes, yes. All right, I'll see you on Monday. Boom. I, I looked over at my wife, Carrie, and go, we are moving back to Philadelphia, baby. And I just couldn't have been happier. So it started, it started there. That's, that's where the deep rooted Philadelphia ties are in, inside you just burn inside you because the passion of the town, the, it's such a great sports town. It's such a great food town. Um, little things like I like history. So you're three hours from DC, you're, you're close to New York city. You're, the location of Philadelphia itself is, is just really, really a, a, a lot of fun and, and a great place to be. Um, but getting back to that year, you know, the first time you walk in that building, you're like, man, like, oh, this is awesome. Like, you know, and you see road signs that you recognize in high school and you see Villanova basketball on TV. That then, you know, no offense, but people's other other people than me, their last name isn't a vowel. You know what I'm saying? There's some, there's some, some Italian Americans around, you know, like, so it's just, it, it's just a very welcoming feeling. It's a great place. Um, it, it came to, like a head when we had the Super Bowl parade and I had a bunch of my high school buddies texting me being like, Hey, I'm going to be mm -hmm. on this corner. We can wave to my, my family. I'd had four or five or six text messages of guys that I'd, I've been kept in contact with. I graduated high school in 96. Um, so do the math of that. And uh, it was just very humbling um, to be a part of something that special and, and something that an area of the country that they longed for that for so long. And, just to see the fans' reactions to when it finally happened. You know, people just sent some YouTube said, like, hey, watch my dad when that ball hit the ground on the Hail Mary. Like, it literally just humbles you to be able to be a part of something that special. And, and, and because when you're part of something that special, you, it, when you win something like that, you realize how, how special it is for so many more people. And I think that's, that's the really cool part of it. John, your, your dad, Gene, was a former coach and, as Jeff said, athletic director, athletic director for Villanova and also Boston College. Yeah. When you moved to Philly, and I know you were a kid then, but did you notice over a series of years how passionate this fan base was? Yes. It, yeah. Uh, and, um, I mean, I went to a ton of Eagles games when I oh. was there. I mean, I, we went to a ton. Uh, I went to probably the most games I went to was the Sixers because – um, with Villanova playing down at, at the then Spectrum at the time, uh, my dad had a parking pass. So I'd stick the parking pass in my car, go down and buy like, you know, $8 tickets to sit in the Raptors. <laughs> you know, it's just, so I've, I've been to a ton of games and the, the passion of the fan base is, is, is really, is unreal. It's unmatched really uh, when you think about it. Um, and they'll tell you when you're doing good and they'll tell you when you're not doing so good, <laughs> you know? So, uh, and you know, where you, you always know where you stand. So that's all you can ask. So you had moved around a lot as a kid because your dad was a coach, a college football coach. I know you'd been all, all across the area, but when you came to Philadelphia and you guys settled in Radnor, you know, you mentioned uh, being among the people with vowels at the end of your name. Was it, was it gravy or sauce? Did you have to get used to gravy? I had to work there. 
That's a very important question. <laughs> I love that. That's a great question. <laughs> You know, um, it was gravy to my grandmother, uh -huh. and it's I've always called it sauce. So I'm, I'm a, you know, it's I've kind of gone changed with the times a little bit. That's an awesome question. Well, there was a running joke if the Eagles had drafted Sauce Gardner that they were going to have to call him gravy just to satisfy <laughs> Philly. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Uh, uh, shout out you know, to Franco, Dante, and Luigi's absolutely there you go. down down there. Absolutely. Now, for those watching this, uh, we both podcast and on YouTube. For those uh, watching this on YouTube, they can see over what I think is your right shoulder is your Radner High football jersey right there. That's your right. Yeah. I can't tell. You know, you never know what the mirror imaging going on. But, yeah, yeah. your Radner High football jersey there. Was it, What was that experience like just playing quarterback here in this area in high school? It was, it was cool. You know, when, um, when we moved here, I was going in my sophomore year, uh, and my parents kind of gave me a – like a, like a little bit of a map saying, hey, you know, we're moving you and your sister during high school. We we're both very good athletes. Um, they're like, you guys can kind of pick where you want to go to school. Like, we are within reason. Um, and, you know, I went to a few schools and met with the coaches. And the, Radner's program was, was way down at the time. And I met with Coach Virgilio and George Hobson, my offensive coordinator, and uh, met with those guys. And, you know, they sold a vision to where they – saw the program going and I could be a major help. And uh, my sister felt was on board as well to go to Radnor. Uh, it's an unbelievable school academically. It's a beautiful area. We live right there in Rosemont. I, was, I used to say I was a, a driver and an eight iron from going to this campus so I could walk up to practice and, you know, and do those things is a, that's really important, to, was important to me is in, at high school age. And I was fortunate enough, uh, my first start, we broke our 34 game losing streak against Pennhurst. Oh. And, uh, nice. yeah, it was really neat. Um, and, again, it just goes back to on a much, much smaller stage, you know, how happy people are after victories like that, uh, obviously on a smaller stage. But, um, yeah, it's, it was – Radnor is a place I've met a ton of great people. My teachers were awesome. My coaches were great. Um, and they welcomed me with open arms, me and my sister. John, you know – we know your dad was a coach, right? And then you would later after Radnor High, you would, you would play college football at James Madison. But where did the coaching bug come into play for your career? Way before that. Mm. Um, yeah, way before that. Uh, you know, I, I kind of knew what I wanted to, like, I kind of knew what I wanted to do uh, very early on in life, uh, probably when I was around 10 or 11. And I knew, like, I was in a, you know, when you grow up as a coach's kid, AD's kid, it, you can be in a little bit of a tough spot at times because everyone expects you to be the best athlete. Everyone expects you to be, you know, on the straight and narrow all the time. Everyone expects a lot out of you. And, and some, some guys don't really like that. I, I was fine with it. Um, but I did at the same time want to choose a little bit different career path than, than my dad just to kind of pave my own way. But I knew I wanted to coach football. So um, very early in life, I decided my goal was to be an NFL coach. And um, hmm. um, I was, like I said, I was probably 10 or 11 at the time. Wow. And uh, so I just became just totally immersed in NFL football. Uh, and, and, you know, not that I didn't love his game and stuff. I'm, that's not it. But just from the path I knew I wanted to take, I try to do something every single day to help me get there. Hmm. Uh, whether it be write a, write a letter to a coach, whether it be to reach out to somebody, little things, whether it be, um, learning how to introduce yourself to people, you know, like when you're that age, like, you know, little, little things like that where you try to make an impression on people. And um, I had great mentors, like, you know, being around guys like, like a Steve Lapis at Villanova, mm. let me go on the road with him. Wow. You know, Dave Clawson, who actually called me this morning, he's now the head coach at Wake Forest. He was the OC at Villanova. So, you know, during that time, I was very impressionable. And I had two guys that were, high up in the two main sports at Villanova that I just adored. I mean, absolutely adored. And, um, you know, Coach Lapp is now doing TV. And, and like I said, Coach Clawson is now the head coach at Wake. And uh, they welcomed me at practice at any time. They were great to me and, and knew my goals. And um, like I said, they're mentors to this day. And uh, so it was really, that, that, was, that was awesome. I'm not sure how it happened in Philly, but two of the most unmistakable voices in college basketball coaching had to be Steve Lapis and John Chaney right there in the same city. Lapis had that, you know, that, that very echoey voice. I mean, it's unmistakable because you could, you could yeah. just 
you can hear it with your eyes closed, you know? So he always used to tell the players, hey, guys, one movie per room per night. That's when we're on the road. <laughs> one movie per room per night. Hey, your bag's got to be on the bus by 3.30. That's oh, he's got a great voice, man. <laughs> so, so you got into a college coach. I think at, uh, you played quarterback, right? And then mm-hmm. you uh, at, um, at JMU, you were a Duke. Yep. Uh, but then as a coach, you started off at Fordham, and then you went yep. to Notre Dame, and then back to the Columbia there. So – you, you've been at like small schools, big schools. Um, you, you've coached with some pretty decorated coaches. What, while you were a college coach and learning the art of coaching in general, what, what did you take and, and who did you take it mostly from? Well, going back to our last, con- our last question, um, mm-hmm. the guy I gave my first job was Coach Lawson. So he left right. Villanova to go be the head coach at Fordham. And then I was there for nine months I was there for one season and he turned that program around like he's turned over he's turned around every program he's been at uh, and then left there to go to Richmond uh, but be working with him and him being in the quarterback meeting room with him every day he he was amazing and just learning the nuances of his offense and really what working with coach Clawson taught me that you know he was very flexible in terms of changing things but at the end of the day he still had his core beliefs which he believed in so you're always evolving, but at the end of the day, this is what you hang your hat on when, when times are getting tough. Hey, I believe in this. I believe in this. And Coach Clausen's awesome with, with that. And I went to Notre Dame as a graduate assistant coach uh, mm-hmm. under Bob Davey. And working with Coach Davey, um, it really taught me work ethic and detail. I mean, because he was big, and I talk about this a lot, he was big on coaching coaches. Uh, he, and he would maybe not do it in the most PC way all the time. And that's okay. <laughs> and, and that's okay. Um, every guy has, every person has their, their way of going about things. And um, I've just got a ton of respect for Coach Davey. Um, that is not an easy job, man, being the head coach of Notre Dame. That is not an easy job. Uh, right. for, we could have a two-hour podcast on that, on why that's such <laughs> a great place and why it's such a hard job and everything in between. Mm-hmm. I mean – um, so, you know, it was his first head coaching job and he, he, you know, they went to the Fiesta Bowl year one, I think. And so anyway, so then I get my first full-time job, um, uh, with coach Shoup, Bob Shoup at Columbia. And, um, he really let me grow into the job. I was very young. It was my first time on the road recruiting, having your own area, having to stay organized, um, having to have a relationship with high school coaches, um, you know, having to map out your day, having be a position coach for the first time. And Coach Shoup would always, you know, pull me aside and say, hey, try this next time we're recruiting. Like, you know, he was, he had a different way about him than Coach Davey, but they, we, they got, it got to the same area, it got to the same final landmark. And um, I really credit those three guys for letting me grow before I got my first chance with Coach Coughlin as a quality control coach for the New York Giants. Speaking of that, John, you know, you get your first pro job in 2005 and 06. Offensive quality control coach. And then I think, did, correct me if I'm wrong, did, did they, were they interested in hiring Chip Kelly for a job there around the same time? Um, yeah. That's, I don't know if it was a quarterback job or, or my job. I, 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 I forget. That was, was such a long time ago. Gotcha. But I had known Coach Kelly since he uh, recruited me uh-huh. in high school. Uh, uh-huh. He was the OC at the University of New Hampshire. And he recruited me, he came down to my high school at Radnor and, and met with me for the day and wanted me to come visit there at, up at, uh, at, um, at UNH. And um, it just didn't work out because uh, the JMU coaches were coming into school. Like he came on a Monday morning, like, the JMU coaches were coming in the next day and I was committing to them. Like it, I just wanted to commit to them in person, like to have them at, at the school. Uh, so just the timing of it didn't work out. Um, and I've, I've been, I know coach Kelly very well. I mean, um, through my playing days. And then when I was, my dad took the AD's job at BC, he would come work the football camp, hmm. you know, at, at BC for, you know, it was a four week, like four, one week sessions of camp. He was up there the whole time because that was big recruiting for, you know, the UNHs of the world and the JMUs of the world and, and Villanova and those people. Um, so he was up there the whole time. So I got to work with him a lot and he is a bright, bright offensive mind. <laughs> Were you in Prella when he came to recruit you? I mean, he wasn't the Chip Kelly that people knew from Oregon or the NFL no, coach. But, what was your impression of him when he came to recruit you? But in, in our world of Northeast football, like, yeah. and you kind of know everyone, they were lighting up the scoreboard, man, mm-hmm. even at that time. So, I mean, you knew 
they were, I mean, I don't want to say they're dropping 50 on people, but they were, they were dropping like high thirties, low forties on people Yep. and uh, moving the ball up and down the field. And, and uh, so you knew then they had something really cool going on up there. Uh, it's just, like I said, just didn't work out at the time, with the timing of the JV thing. So, John, you know, you, you work for Coach Coughlin, mm-hmm. who's Super Bowl winning head coach. And you, you uh, reconnect with Coach Coughlin later w- when you both were in Jacksonville. But what was it like to work for a guy like Tom Coughlin who accomplished so much in college football at BC? We know what he did with the Giants. What was it like uh, for, to work for Coach? It was awesome. And not everyone would probably say that. Here's what I, here's the best thing I, I love about working for coach. So whenever we, unfortunately, both years I was there, we got beat in the first round of the playoffs. Mm. Uh, one year by the Carolina Panthers, we were beat up. We were missing like eight starters. One of those just perfect storm games. We got housed at home. I think it was 38 to seven. And then we got beat. It was either at the last se- second field goal or in overtime. I forget in Philadelphia and at the next year in 2006, and David Akers kicked the field goal to beat us in the playoffs. So it's, um, I think Jeff Garcia started that game. Mm-hmm. He did. Okay. Um, amazing. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. But, you, know, <laughs> you know, but anyway, um, two days after the season was over, coach would bring you in and hand you the schedule from that day to vacation. Wow. And it was just – and you knew exactly what you're doing every single second of the day. So there was no surprises. Like there were no emergency staff meetings. There were no, there was nothing like that was wow. boom, 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 boom. And I operate. I love that structure. Like I operate really well personally in that structure. Like I, I have no problems taking orders. I have, you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. Cool. No, no questions asked. Like, Hey, do I agree with everything that we're doing? Probably not, but I agree with most of it. And that's my job. You told me to do something, I'm going to do it. So I operated really well in that environment. Uh, and I, you know, it just so happened I got my first quarterback job with the Raiders. And that's the only reason I left. I mean, coach was pretty mad at me when I left. Like he and I didn't talk for a few years. Like he was pretty mm. mad at me. Uh, wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, I get it. He spent a lot of time with me and felt like I was, you know, I, I worked hard for him. And, and you know, um, so I, I get where he was coming from. And we, we've since, you know, I was talked it out, and, uh, you know, so, uh, but yeah, there was, I was upset inside because like, I felt like I was letting down like my football mm. bad, you know, and like, I was, I don't want to say scared to talk to him, but like, you know how it is with your mentor sometimes. It's like, you feel like you disappointed somebody. It's, that's a bad feeling. You know, so, uh, yeah, but Coach and I are good now. He actually lives about a mile and a half from here right now. Oh, wow. Nice. So So, so let me fast forward a little bit because you just said two things that I think will resonate with Eagles fans who listen to our show, who know about you from your time in Philadelphia. Coach Davey, Coach Coughlin, two guys who not afraid to tell you what they think, not afraid to challenge you, detailed and clearly had an impact on you as a coach because when you came here, and you still are, I think, you, you had a reputation of being a guy who is not a coddler, who's going to tell you how it is, and that's how you reach quarterbacks. You challenge them. And it's our understanding that's how it worked with Carson Wentz. When he, you, you guys came in at the same time, he was talented, but you know he didn't have that much experience coming from North Dakota State. Did you feel straight up meeting him, knowing him, getting to know him, and here at the Eagles that this was going to be a guy – that was talented, but that you were going to have to stay on and, you know, challenge? Yeah, I, I, would, I would. That's a great question. And, and yeah, that's a piece of my coaching style um, when it needs to be. Mm-hmm. I like to think I have a change up every once in a while as well, instead of the fastball all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I pride myself in trying to get to know my guys on and like in the building and, you know, hey, let's go out to dinners. That, and, that, and that way we both let our guards down a little bit. So I, I, I kind of, I try to know when to push, push the gas and when to hit the brake, mm-hmm. you know, and know when a guy needs a push, know a guy's facial expressions. I know when he's having a bad day, maybe something's mm-hmm. going off the field mm-hmm. um, where you need to find out about that. But yeah. And, and I think that that's any quarterback I've coached. I think, I think different guys can take different styles. I, I, when we drafted Carson, um, Carson was one of the, if, not the most physically gifted, one of the most physically gifted quarterbacks I've ever worked with. 
Um, he has got genius mentality to him in his, in his head. He, he is, he is beyond bright. Um, he can remember things. He has, he can see things on the field. Um, he can tell you what happened. Uh, he has, he obviously he's physically as gifted as anybody I've coached. Um, and, you know, from an arm, arm town standpoint to his size, to the way he can run, um, flexibility, the way he can get out of, out of, out of a mess in the, in the pocket, uh, he's strong lower body. Um, I mean, there's not enough. I, I could go on all day till tomorrow. I'll talk about the positive attributes of Carson Wentz. So the exciting part as a coach was, holy cow, I get, I get the, I don't piece of this to get them molded and let's make sure we get, we get this done the right way and not waste this opportunity because you don't have that opportunity a lot to coach these guys. There's, there's just not enough of them out there. And, um, you know, the combination of, you know, obviously coach Peterson being the head coach and coach Wright being the OC, those were, I answered to those guys. So again, if they wanted something done, that got done. If, you know, Frank came to me and said, Hey, Carson needs to work on intermediate throws to his left. The first two things we were doing in practice the next day was something to work on intermediate throws to the left. And so I think the combination of all three of us working with Carson and being able to each take our own view of it, because we've all had a lot of experience from the 30,000 foot level of working with these guys. I think when you, we meshed all those th ideas and things together, I think it helped us and helped Carson and helped Nick and, and um, you know, and so it was, a, it was really neat. And I learned a ton from Doug and Frank. I mean, I learned because let's call it what it is. I didn't play in the NFL. All right? I know exactly what I am. I'm a pretty comfortable guy in my own skin, um, knowing my strengths and my weaknesses. Um, and one of my weaknesses is probably when I learned a lot from Doug and Frank was to see it through a, a, a player's point of view and um, when to take, when to let off a little bit. And, um, you know, just hearing, being around Doug and Frank and hearing them tell stories about their Bills days and their Packers days and just seeing it from that view too, uh, I learned a ton. And um, hopefully it's helped me. John, the Sorry, other that long winded answer. I hope I answered your question. No, it's a great answer. Got it. That's good. In fact, I want to, sort of push that forward a little bit. One of the other quarterbacks you work with in 17 was Nate Sudfeld. And I, I remember mm -hmm. going to, um, to a game. It might have been in like October, right? And I saw you warming him up. Now, he was a third-string quarterback. It wasn't for 10 minutes. It might have been an hour. It may have been longer mm -hmm. than that. You would know better than I. I'd not seen that before. Did you ever apply that with another like backup quarterback or quarterback earlier in your career? You know, I started doing that um, when I was in Oakland. And I'd always take the third, the third guy out. And the guy that gave me that idea was Greg Knapp. Uh -huh. And um, unfortunately, Coach Knapp uh, suffered a horrific uh, biking accident last summer uh, and is no longer with us. He's, I think about him every day and he's, and he's missed greatly. And um, that, Greg, Knapper was like my father in football. Like he was literally my dad. Like he was my, and uh, there was probably, wasn't a couple of weeks that went by we didn't talk on the phone or at least text uh, since I left Oakland. He and I left Oakland together. Uh, so anyway, he's the one that started doing that with, uh, you know, his guys when he was younger. And Greg is known as a tremendous quarterback developer and very similar coaching style. Uh, you know, deep, I mean, Greg's way more detailed than me. Like, it, it's incredible how I mean, he's detailed to the color he writes the quarterback notes in. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's that. It's incredible. So, wow. again, got to learn from him. Sure. And so, again, coaching your coaches, he would every week, he'd make me on Thursday afternoon, I'd have a sheet and I'd say, Hey, Greg, here's what we're doing pregame. We've got three hours before the game before anyone's out there. This is what we're working on this week. And so, when I got to Philadelphia, I saw again, Nate, who has a ton of talent, and you're like, man, this is going to be fun. This dude's a warrior, too. Like, this dude wants to work. Like, this dude, like, we're in L.A., okay? We're in L.A. playing the Rams. Uh, the night we clinched in 17, the night we clinched the uh, NFC East, and the night Carson went down, um, it's probably 80 degrees out there, 85 degrees. It's a hot day in L.A. And uh, so Nate and I are out there three hours before the game, like always. And uh, he starts turning like beet red in the face. 
right? And like his eyes sweat and profuse. And this is like 40 minutes in. His eyes start like doing something weird. And I'm like, all right, bro, that's it. We're done. Go in. He's, he's like, he, wanted to, he literally like, almost want to fight me. Like, he's like, I'm not going in. We have 20 minutes to go. I was like, dude, go inside. <laughs> like, I like that's, I literally had to like grab him by the back of the neck, like walk him in. <laughs> Make sure he put like a, 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 hot, a cold towel on. Just, that's just the kind of dude he is. He wants yeah. to get better. And so I here's, I do the math. All right. So usually the back of quarterbacks play and uh, they play in the preseason. So you don't do it in the preseason. But most of them, the third string doesn't play. So if you get an hour of individual time with your coach, excluding playoffs, so you make playoffs, that's 16 hours of individual time that you can't get back. And that, that was my, that's whenever, if, if I spent 16 hours on my golf swing, I'm going to have a better swing. I hope, <laughs> you know, so True. Theoretically. that's the way <laughs> I approached it with those guys and, and, and said, you know, hey, by the end of the year, man, we're going to get 16 great hours of individual time man and the guys that really want to be developed love it most of the guys i've been fortunate that that they want to do it that was a very um you know that well, that was the start of a very crazy day for you, your coaching staff for the eagles i mean carson had played at an mvp level then he gets hurt uh and then the reality setting in that he's going to be out for the rest of the year what was that like we've heard so much about what was that like for the team but not necessarily for for the quarterbacks coach of the team at the time. Yeah, um, that was a tough day because as 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 happy as you were that I mean we're all wearing the NFC or the NFC East hats in the locker room and no and you look at the pictures and it's a very somber mood. Mm -hmm. Now guys, we're all happy because it, it is a team thing, but let's call it what it is. We 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 lost the MVP of the league that day, and um, you know. It was, uh, we all felt bad for Carson, number one, you know, because mm -hmm. the amount of work he had put in uh, and the amount of um, what he put into that team was obviously an MVP level. Um, but then, you know, I, I was like, you better snap out of this and get, get Nick ready to roll. Like, I'm going to give myself to this. The wheels are down in Philadelphia airport to sulk a little bit and, and it's full speed ahead. Um, because if you don't, that's, you're letting the team down, you're letting the coaching staff down, you're letting the guys in your room down. Like if I did, if Nick Foles didn't think I was giving him my full effort and you know, that that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, you had to move on. John, I, I want to back up just a little bit from the end of 2016 to 2017. Mm -hmm. And you've coached so many quarterbacks. I, I know you coach as high as Carson Palmer, but you coach a lot of younger quarterbacks. How does a guy go from 16, where by rookie standards is pretty good, to playing at an MVP level in the second year? That just doesn't happen. How, if you could, give us an idea of the maturation process of that particular quarterback and how it happened. Yeah, it, it started the day after the 2016 season was over. And, and Carson and I had a, I forget how long it was, but it was a, it was a somewhat lengthy sit-down meeting after the season. And... You know, I said, Carson, I said, before you head, you know, back to, you know, North Dakota and across the river to Jersey hunting and all that, I said, Let, let's start the roadmap to 17 right now. Like, let's, you and I brainstorm here together, all right? And, you know, let's talk about what each other can get better at. Like, let's talk about what, what, what can I do for you that's going to help you out more? And, and then I've got a few ideas where I think you can help out the team more, you know? And, and let's put those on paper and not 10 things. Okay, not, not 10 things. Let's choose five or six things where we can, you know, that's things we can evaluate. And, you know, we can sit down after a month and say, hey, where are we here? You know, and, and um, you know, so I'll, I'll keep those things that we wrote down on paper between him and I. Um, but some things were, you know, off the field things. And, and nothing to do like going out and all that. Cars, you don't have to worry about that with him. I'm just yeah. talking about some you know, relationship. With, mm -hmm. you know and and you know um just things you talk about with every quarterback but let's let's really zero in on what we want, what we want to hone in on and we put together the list and um it took some time and and i'll tell you what you got to give a kid a lot of credit boy like i'll give you one of the physical things was vertical pushes and it's vertical pushes up in the pocket and not having the ball sail on us i said that's one physical area that we're going to work on every day from the start of OTAs till the last practice 
we were going to work on some sort of vertical climb in the pocket where our shoulders don't go straight to the sky and there goes the ball. And so that became, by the end of the season, again, you talk about having a plan for working with these guys, like that became one of Carson's biggest strengths. And because he accepted it, that that's something he needed to work on. And we communicated that. And so when we have a player that wants to get better and a coach that wants to put in the time to help the player get better, it's good for everybody, you know? And yeah. so that's how we, that's how it started. And there wasn't a ton Carson needed to change. It's just, he needed experience. He didn't play a ton in college. You know, he had the wrist injuries, you know, his last year there in North Dakota and came back and played the championship game. Uh, but he didn't play a ton of football. Hearing you talk about that vertical climb, I think about, it's just a, a moment I won't forget. I think it was in a lot. Didn't, didn't you guys lose to Seattle the week before the LA game? Yes. And you were down early, if I remember, and by a couple of touchdowns. And then Carson threw, a, I think, to Nelson Aguilar. He threw one of the most amazing touchdowns in the left corner of the end zone that yep. came from a great pocket climb. He just had his, it was just so textbook. And the arm and the throw, it was just one of those vintage Carson plays from 2017 that even in a loss, I remember people were talking about that touchdown throw um, and the ability that, yeah, they lost. It was broken nine game win or 10 game win streak, but what he was able to do in that, that moment. But that, that was one of those plays that really stands out to me about just the kind of talent that he had had uh, oh. and, and showcase to the, the league that year. He's so strong. He's so strong. Yeah. Like, do you remember that play that I'm talking about? That, Absolutely. One? Yeah. Here's, here's what, honestly, like, so we're up in North Dakota, we're up in Fargo. And I, first time I saw Carson play, was the senior bowl practice. So I just it went down the senior bowl. I just literally just got into Philadelphia like maybe five days earlier. And we jump on the plane to go to the senior bowl. And I, I just see this guy running around from drill to drill. That's why I love going to the senior bowl. Cause I love evaluating these guys, like watching them practice. Like how does this guy love football? Like this guy love it. Like, does he like it? Or does he freaking love it? Okay. I watched Carson that day at practice. And I was like, this guy loves football. I'm like, I'm like, he was sprinting from drill to drill, giving guys high fives, it, it, you know, watching the one-on-one -on -one drill, ball coming out on time. I'm like, man, I love the way this guy practices, man. This guy's full speed all the time. And, um, and that's how we practice. We practice full speed all the time. There's game, we practice game speed, game speed, game speed. There's no tiptoeing to the tulips. It's just game speed. And so that's how we practiced. And it was, that's when I really was like, Man, this, this guy has a chance to be a really good player. And actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a real nugget back. So I'm sitting playing, I'm on the OC of the Browns in 15, and we're getting ready to play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And they have a small TV in the visitors' locker room, right? And North Dakota State is playing, I think, Weber State. And all of a sudden I see this big kid escape the pocket and run. I look at our quarterback coach, I go, who is that guy? I go, who is that? Like, you know, and I'm like, I said, go, go find me out who that guy is. I said, I, that was a pro move right there. Uh -huh. And so, you know, it's just guys with that much talent and they just jump off the screen at you. When you work with Carson Palmer, well, he was in the middle of his career and, and you, were, mm. he, you guys were together with the Raiders and you talk about you know, greatness. What was it like to coach him? Oh, my gosh. Um, that's why I, I was... I was UOC at San Jose State before I went back to the, to the Raiders. And I went back. I left San Jose because uh, I had a really good job. And I, I loved coaching at San Jose. It was two of the most fun years I've ever had coaching. It was fun coaching. Those kids love to play football. And so Carson's the reason I went back to the Raiders. Hmm. That's, that's the reason I went back. Was I'd never worked with a guy like that. And I thought, you know, I'm going to learn just as much from him as he's going to learn from me. And again, seeing the game, like I talked about it, like I learned with Coach Peterson and Coach Wright, you know, I, I, the same thought process was going through there working with a guy like Carson. Uh, Carson uh, Palmer is probably in the top two or three most talented passers I've ever coached. Like his mechanics, like if you, if you watched a quarterback mechanic-wise, he is like the Mona Lisa of quarterbacks. Like he is... Everything he does, he's got wide base short stride. He's got um, short release. He has tremendous arm talent. He's big, okay? He's a big dude, strong. Um, 
smart, uh, great cadence, which is un- which is underrated for a quarterback. Unbelievable cadence. I learned so much about cadence from him and how to voice inflect and, and all that. Um, the little tricks of the trade that these veteran guys know just through experience, it was really cool to watch him operate. And, and um, you know, it's unfortunately we, we traded him and uh, to the Cardinals and he ended up playing really, really well for the Cardinals. Um, Carson, funnier than heck. I mean, he is a funny dude, fun to work with every day. Uh, so th- that was a really neat experience. Flip, you spent the last two years with the Chicago Bears. You've been there. You were their quarterbacks coach, also their passing game coordinator. We know that the Bears were kind of going back and forth with a couple of quarterbacks with Mitch Trubisky. Then they draft, um, yeah, three different quarterbacks, right? There's Nick Foles, Mitch Trubisky, and of course, uh, Justin Fields, Justin Fields as, Andy well, as well. As yeah. well. Andy Dalton. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and Andy, that's right. Four. So, well, three, uh, but, yeah, three last year. Right. Oh, that's right. Three in one year. My gosh. Um, let, let's, and they all won a game. How about that? Let's let's rewind though, because the organization has been looking for for its future quarterback here. I'm sure you um, wind up interviewing or scouting several quarterbacks over the last two years. Did Jalen Hurts come across your radar at all? Did you get to see him, scout him? What were your your impressions of him? Uber competitive. Um, obviously, the athletic traits just jump off of, off of tape at you when you, when you watch him. Um, I I that was. I watched him, I interviewed him at the Combine, uh, really enjoyed my conversation with him. He has uh, a little bit of a good, arrogant, not arrogant, uh, confidence to him. Mm-hmm. I-, I thought from a, a quarterback standpoint, I thought he was a very confident guy, which I like. Um, and I thought, you know, he's got arm talent, um, who has another strong guy I can get out of a, can get out of a jam mm-hmm. and, and throws it plenty good enough to make every throw. I mean, it's, it's not shocking to me he's having success and, and that the Eagles really like him. That That's not shocking to me at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could just tell that this this guy, and, and from what I heard from, you know, there, you know, some of the guys there is he really, really wants to be coached. It's from what I've heard from, from some of their guys. Like he is, like we talk about living the quarterback lifestyle all the time. He, he you know, you eat football, you sleep football, you breathe football, you, you walk around, you think about football. From what I've heard about him as a young man, he he lives that quarterback lifestyle and wants to be great. So that's not shocking to me. He's having success. John, your style of coaching, you know, they always say you 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 coach hard. Hey, what does that mean? I don't know. Coaching. Yeah, I've always wondered about that. What, what does that mean? Do you, know, you have any idea what that means? I, I, this means you hold your guys accountable. Okay. You know, and, and you don't, you know, you, You've been around some guys or guys make excuses for people. Hey, if, if we, if I always tell the guys, Hey, if we play great, we play great. If we stink, we stink. We'll, we'll find a way to get better, but let's just be honest with ourselves and make sure that we're doing the best we can for the team. And I, you know, I, I, I guess I have a lot of energy practice. I like to, I like, I have fun out there. I think it's fun. I think practice is fun. Like I think football's fun. Like I enjoy to have the relationships with the coaches and players. I think it's fun. And, you know, there's, there's a time to get serious. I get it. Um, but uh, try to keep the meeting room light. Um, you know, so, yeah, I, I just think there's not, you know, I like to coach. I, I, I like to coach. I, I marvel at the different personalities uh, that you've coached and not, in, not just the storylines, right? I mean, you, you, you were Marcus, Jamarcus Russell's quarterback's coach when he got drafted by the Raiders. Yeah. You were Johnny Manziel's quarterback's coach when he mm. was drafted by the Browns. I believe you were Mark Sanchez's uh, coach. Or, or I was more quality control in that role. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I was more quality control in that role. Gotcha. Yeah. But you were there but for I'm, the butt fumble and everything Mark. like that. I'm I love, sure. Yeah. I love Mark. Yeah. So, so, I mean, do you look when you look back? I mean, there's no template. Obviously, everybody's a little bit different. But you do you consider yourself kind of um, fortunate to have been in so many different places and been around so many different personalities and and arm talents and things like that, from Carson to all the other guys we talked about. Yeah, I, I am. I, you know, from a personal standpoint, I wish I didn't have to move as much as I have. Sure. You know, I'm 44. <laughs> I just turned 44 in April. I think I've moved 23 times with my family's oh. job and mine. 
It's a lot, man. And that's one reason why I'm sitting where I'm sitting right now is I, I was just find out I just needed to just it's been a long, long couple years here. Sure. And so, uh, you know, I just didn't want to jump right back in and, and, uh, you know, I, my family deserved that. Uh, and so, um, but yeah, I do think it's a benefit. I know two people are the same, no, no two coaches are the same. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've, I hope that, you know, I think, uh, even though some of the guys I have made out of, I don't want to say you don't like everybody, but I think mm -hmm. there's mutual respect there. You know, there's mutual respect. And at the end of the day, as long as there's mutual respect there, you can function with anybody. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, I've been, I've had great relationships with my, with my guys. And, you know, I've had two guys that have called my Tri-City players, Terrell Pryor and Nick Foles, um, you know, Pryor. and, yeah. you know, no. uh, TP and, and, and I were in Oakland together. And then we were in Cleveland together as a receiver. And then I brought him down to Jacksonville with me as a receiver. Uh, and then um, same thing with Nick. Nick and I have been together three times. And, you know, Nick and I have a very unique relationship. Like, he – we can look at each other and, like, know exactly what each other's thinking. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's, it's like – like, I can look back at him and he, he'll be like, well, what, kind of what Flip means is that, you know, he can – he is, like, he is, you know, it's – he is <laughs> – He's a prince. So, um, yeah, it's to, that special relationship with those guys. One other guy I did want to talk about, because another guy you coached his rookie season, you've worked with so many quarterbacks who developed him, was Derek Carr, who's still going Ooh, strong. Yeah. What was that rookie yeah. season like for you and Derek working together? That was That's a great question. Um, Derek's another guy where you like, you see him in person. And, you know, first time I saw him was I was on the other side. You know, it was the first time I think San Jose had beaten Fresno in Fresno mm -hmm. in like 26 years. We went down there and beat him. And Derek had a really good night. Um, our quarterback, Matt Faulkner, had a good, had a good night. Um, and we ended up beating him, I think, like 28-26 or 26-24. Um, so that my, was my first exposure to Derek. And then, you know, Derek, his quick release. Um, and again, another guy is just uber smart. Um, I mean, football lineage, he's, he's, you know, great football family. Um, you know, I got to know his brother a little bit, you know, him being out there. Just a really cool football family. Uh, very supportive of each other. Um, they're really good people, man, with the cars. And, and I'm just happy that Derek's been able to stay in, in Oakland slash Vegas for as long as he has and has had the success he's had. And, um, you know, I, I love working with him. But getting back to that year, uh, I think this shows Derek's mental toughness because we started the season 0-10. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go out to London and um, Coach Allen gets fired week mm -hmm. four. We fly to my, we play the Miami Dolphins. We got beat pretty bad. And Coach Allen gets, gets let go. And then, um, you know, Tony Sperano, another mentor of mine, takes over and uh, did a great job with the team in a really hard situation. And uh, you know, we won our first game Thursday night football against the Chiefs at home. Mm. And a good team. Chiefs had a good team. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they were in the playoffs that year. So we ended up winning three of our last six games. We beat um, the Chiefs on Thursday night. We beat Buffalo at home. And we beat a really good 49ers team at home as mm. well. Mm. We got beat on the road in New England week three. Uh, on a last second touchdown by the Patriots. We were right in that game. So you could see the progression of Derek along the way. And that's where I use that story, Adam, um, for patience for these guys. You know, I think that's that's the – everyone wants the finished product right now. And you, you guys have asked great questions today. And I think – I hope I've tried to explain to your listeners and viewers that this is a process, man. It, it's not a – these guys are not – most of them aren't – NFL ready right away. And if you, there's some stability there and there's some patience there, you can, you can have a really cool product. And um, the fact that we were starting the season 0 and 10 and Derek wins three of his last six games and plays well, the arrow was up with him and he's, he's done a great job out there. 
Real quick, getting back to your mentality, because Adam, we, we've talked about your ability to challenge people, also about being aggressive. When you aligned with Doug here in Philadelphia, I mean, Doug was probably one of the most aggressive coaches, not only the city, but the league has seen as far as keeping the offense on the field in fourth down, going for yep. two after a touchdown. Was that a natural fit for you? Did that? Did you learn a lot from Doug from that? Because I don't know if a lot of coaches really preached it the way Doug did uh, in 2016 and 17. So I, I viewed myself as an aggressive play caller. And then mm -hmm. I met Coach Peterson. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, dang. I was like, you know, I go, holy cow. Like I said, I said, so I'm kind of like the new guy. I, 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 I didn't have a, a much of a tie with, with, with Coach Peterson or Coach Reich. I, now we know each other to say hello to in passing. We we're both in the AFC West for a long time. Right. But we knew – we knew who each other were in this net. So I just walk up to him one day and I say, Hey coach, I, was like, uh, I said, just from a philosophical standpoint, I'm trying to learn. I said, all the five man protection, man. I said, doesn't that make you nervous? Sometimes? <laughs> he looks at me kind of like, he goes, you got to block them. Like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, but answer I'm like, but that's just, it, it just, it's their learning lessons. Like it's, it, you, that's how you grow as a coach. You, hey, hey coach, just, Picking your brain here. What? Why? Why you feel? Yeah, I block them. I'm like, <laughs> simple enough. <laughs> so, so oh, the one yeah. thing, John, is we, you know, we, we, people have followed your career as a play caller, and, and you know, obviously with the Eagles, your guy will come out throwing the football. Did you get that from your dad as a coach? Any particular coach that you work with that okay, we want to throw the ball a lot? Was that something that you got from anyone in particular working for them? Um, not really. Uh, I've always been my. We talk about the things you hang your hat on. Yeah. Um, I always agree. You don't play any two games the same. What's the opponent's weakness? Let's attack that. So we played the Arizona Cardinals in 18, and and, and they're struggling like they're like 31st against the run. We ran it like 30-something times. Hmm. Okay. Green Bay Packers are starting three rookies in the defensive backfield. Okay. Okay, and they have a really good front seven. Do the math. Like, how do you, how do you think – the best way to attack the Green Bay Packers. So I try to keep it that simple. Gotcha. And I get, you know, you get this reputation at times that you're like to throw the football and all those things. But, you know, I had Adam Thielen, freaking Stefan Diggs, Kyle Rudolph, Kirk Cousins, Dalvin Cook. Okay. That's where the strength of our offense was. Mm -hmm. And um, I could have put our guys in a much better positions at times protection wise. Okay. That's where I failed. Okay. I, I, I and there were times that maybe, uh, I could have been more patient. I'm because to say that I didn't have any fault in what happened in Minnesota, that, that that's ridiculous. Okay, because I did. I could have done a lot of things differently. Um, and I'm 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 a man enough to to admit that and and know again where you look back and self scout yourself. Um, but at the end of the day, I was and again, I I've never met the man but I've observed him from afar and admired him from afar for a long time. And that's coach Belichick and they don't care as long as they have one more point than the other team at the end of the game. That's all they care about and how they do it. They don't care how they do it. Yep. I mean, yep. and they don't care. I mean, you've heard, I listen to it all the time. I go on, on, on YouTube. I listen to these podcasts and stuff on the way home and from work. And, um, there's this one quote he says, is, you know, they said, well, you know, I forget the text. That I'm probably butchering the heck out of this. But the, the gist of it was, hey, you guys haven't, um, they won like three in a row or whatever. You haven't scored more than 21 points. He's like, stats are for losers. <laughs> Scoreboards are for winners. <laughs> I'm like, it's that simple. Like, yep. it's that simple. Like, and I don't want to take away, it's not simple, but that mindset is, is how are we going to attack the opponent this week? Whenever you play the New England Patriots, all right, you are going to get something you have not seen before, all right, and how they view you. And you have no idea how they view you. So you're not in their meetings. You may view us a, a different way than they view you. So you know you're going to get something. So case in point, so they come out. We play them on Sunday Night Football, and um, we knew they were going to play double-double, okay, double-double, which means they're going to double Stefan Diggs, and they're going to double Adam Thielen. So hmm. how do we try to counter that? All right. We tried to make it to, as difficult on them as we could so we could maybe motion across, shift across, whatever. And then we 
ran what we call a basic pump, which the best way to beat a bracket is to split it. So if there's a player here and a player here, right, and they're in and out in my head right now, the best way to break that is just go right through it. So a little stutter, boom, right through it. And unfortunately, we missed the throw. Um, but you got to anticipate as a coach, hey, how do you think they view us? But you're going to get something on scout from the Patriots every single time you play them. And uh, so I give those guys a lot of credit. I'm, I'm still laughing at the uh... – the, the five-man protection because I think John you, you should have known right you were with the Giants in 2006 so you should remember the game where Andy Reid Doug's mentor refused to protect his left tackle his his second year left tackle starting in place of uh, the great Trey Thomas and then of course Donovan McNabb got sacked not once not twice not three times but was, I think it was six times many of them by OCU and your six or seven. yeah it was a lot of sacks right there but that, the for a week everybody's Andy what why didn't you put a put some help next to next to uh, Winston Justice there? But that's Doug's mentor, so you know where it comes from. And that's you know what at the end of the day, that's what you believe in. Cool, sure. Like you know, like hey, yeah. both guys got Super do. Bowl rings. Exactly, <laughs> the guys won a lot of games doing it his way. Awesome. Can't fault him for that. One more quarterback I want to talk to you about, and this guy's had had really big success with you as a six round pick. That's Gardner Minshew's. Eagles number two quarterback yeah. that season. I, I you would probably know better now. How many? I don't. He, what did he win? Like a half a dozen awards, rookie of the week or something. He was, I think, the seven time rookie of the week. Okay, he was wow. six well, six and one well, as a start. No, was why six. was he so good? Considering no one had any expectations start. for him. What, what did what did you see from him? Um, that's another guy I could spend all day talking about positive attributes. <laughs> um, I think that Gardner. Gardner's a, like has a mind like Carson Wentz. Like, like there's some genius tendencies in there with Gardner, man. Like the game's play, the game's slow for Gardner. Like the game, like it's just it, it's just slows down for him. And um, like he knows his strengths and weaknesses in terms of Gardner's sneaker athletically than people give him credit for too, man. Like he is like the big tree trunk legs and you know get out of stuff and. Uh, He's sneakier athletically than people give him credit for. But Gardner, Gardner keeps the game really simple. Like, hey, this, this guy's off corner over here. We have a hitch called. I'm going to take the hitch and play second and three football. Like, he, he keeps it, the game really simple. And the game is really slow for him. And, um, like, he, he played really well for us. He played really, really well for us. And I wish I could have done more for him. Um, again, you look back and I wish I would have done some other things with him but um you know there's a fine line there with the rookies too and especially early on when you're on the road and making sure you protect and but uh there was a game or two I probably should have taken the handcuffs off him a little week earlier than I did uh, but um yeah he's awesome man and talk about a dynamic personality yeah <laughs> like you you like you can't help but love that guy <laughs> like the first time I saw him, like, you know, I, I, cause I, you, I do a lot of social media searching and, and I like to watch the guys in interviews and how they conduct themselves yeah. in front of the media. And I like to know a lot about that guy before they come in. So I watch as much as I can on social media as I can with these guys. If you, you can't help but love that guy. Like I see him in the jorts for the first time. And I'm like, yeah, this is like, this is like, but that's his deal. That's like, that's real. Like, that's just his deal, man. And it's Unique. just, he is an infectious personality. Like, it's just, you can't help but feel his, like, his mm -hmm. love for the game. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. and his teammates feel too. No doubt. No doubt. John, it's almost been an hour, so we really appreciate the time. It's been great. Already? Um, Man, it's yeah, been awesome. I know, it flies. I know. It's, I know. It's, been a, I know. it's been fabulous catching up with you. Um, before we get you out of here, we have to know, though, what I know you're, you're taking the kind of year to decompress after all the moving around, but. You still want to coach in the NFL? I mean, do you see yourself by next year, maybe trying oh, to get yeah. back and do something? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, awesome. yeah. There's, I, I, I yeah, one hundred percent. It's just, um, you know, there's an. It was just time. It, it, it was time, and uh, to take a year and take a breather. And um, I'm very fortunate. I have a, a 21 month old daughter, so my wife every about once a week when I start getting I, I get that itch all the time i'm like man she should be at the combine she should be at the senior bowl yeah my, my wife's like when are you ever going to get this time again with us like 
and you're still under contract with the Bears. When are you ever going to get this time again? And she's right. And um, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a supportive wife and daughter, and they're awesome. So being a dad and playing a lot of golf, that seems to be the year's uh, you know, agenda, right? Yeah, and you know what? There's one thing. I We had a turtle foundation. I Actually, I my team won it. And I, I'll be honest with you, I never in a million years would have thought that my name would be something next to first place in golf. So it tells you, it tells you something right there. So I never thought my name would be associated with anything positive to do with golf. But we're grinding down here and trying to get better. Nice. There you go. All right. Well, again, Thank you so much. It's been great catching up with you. I think Eagles fans are really going to love the, the trip down memory lane 2016 and, of course, 2017 Super Bowl and just all the great personalities that you've been around the game, both as with coaches and players. It's been uh, awesome to hear the insights and the memories. So thanks so much and really appreciate the time. And best of luck. Thanks to all your listeners. Thanks to you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, city of Philadelphia, consider it home. Always a special place. And uh, looking forward to getting back sometime soon. Excellent. For John D. Filippo and Adam Kaplan, I'm Jeff Mosher. You've been watching Inside the Birds TV.